In this video, we're going to talk about quantum numbers. Now, in the previous few videos, we established the Bohr model as, an, as a model for the atom. However, it has a severe limitation. The Bohr model is only accurate for one electron systems, right? We did a, pre, a calculation in the previous video on a hydrogen atom, right? We know that has one electron. Um, and Bohr's model is only really accurate for these systems that have one electron, either hydrogen or some ion that's hydrogen-like which this severely limits our ability to treat atoms and molecules since everything else involves multiple electrons. So uh, Bohr's model, while a good way to establish the base level physics necessary to treat the atom, it's very limited in its application. So it will, of course, is necessary to move on to a better model. And that better model comes from what we call the quantum model. And the quantum model is based on Schrodinger's equation. And this equation requires a lot of high level mathematics, linear algebra and calculus to be able to really figure out. But its uh, solutions are going to be very useful regardless of the stage of chemistry that you're at, whether it's general chemistry on up to advanced coursework. Now, um, if you if you have to take physical chemistry, you'll spend an entire semester solving this equation. <laughs> but um, as, as at least at this level, we want to just be able to understand this equation on a basic level and understand what its solutions are telling us. So basically Schrodinger's equation has three pieces. Uh, the first is this H hat that you see here. This little you know symbol above it is called hat. It, de it denotes that this is an operator. And basically this H is known as the Hamiltonian operator. And what it does is it includes all of the energy contributions to your system. It includes operators for each of the energy contributions in your system, kinetic energy, potential energy, whatever else is going on in your, in your quantum system, it's going to be contained in that Hamiltonian operator as an energy contribution. The E here is going to be the total energy of your electron or of your, your quantum system, right? So E is going to be your total energy, right? Once you have all these contributions added up in the Hamiltonian from kinetic and potential energy, E is going to be your total energy. And the big piece to Schrodinger's equation is what's known as the wave function here. Oops, let me put that back, had my eraser out accidentally. Yeah, so this is the wave function. So wave the wave function is what we call really the solutions of schrodinger's equation and what the wave function does is it actually gives you a little bit of insight into the position and location of your electron right we actually refer to these solutions um, of schrodinger's equation these wave functions uh, we call them orbitals Right. The solutions to Schrodinger's equation we can define as orbitals. And the whole goal of quantum numbers is to be able to give an easy label to these orbitals that we get from Schrodinger's equation. Right. So now there are four key quantum numbers that you need to be familiar with. And the first one is known as the principal quantum number. I'll say principal quantum number. I'll use QN to uh, abbreviate quantum number. So the principal quantum number, we use the letter N to denote the principal quantum number. And this quantum number can take on any integer value from one to infinity, right? So it's going to be an integer value, right? So it could be one, two, three dot 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 on and on and on right this can take any integer value as a principal quantum number and what does this principal quantum number tell us well it gives us insight into the size and the energy of your orbital right so this gives us the size and energy of your orbital right so this is going to be something that's very crucial to uh to denote for your um, electron because it gives you you know some indication of where it's located relative to the nuclei and how energetic it is so for these principal quantum numbers we also say that this dictates the shell of your electron right so we say that this is the shell now the second quantum number that you need to be familiar with is known as the angular momentum quantum number so we have angular momentum quantum number 
and we use um, L to denote the angular momentum quantum number, right? Now, the angular momentum quantum number, and in fact, all the quantum numbers outside of the principal quantum number are going to have certain restrictions based on them, right? So uh, for the angular momentum quantum number, it is also an integer value. However, it's going to be restricted uh, between zero to n minus one, right? That n is the principal quantum number, right? So let's say that you're in the second shell, right? Let's say that your principal quantum number is two. Then that means the possible values of your angular momentum quantum number are going to be zero and one. Right. So it's going to be the angular momentum quantum number is going to be restricted by the principal quantum number. Right. And so this um, this angular momentum quantum number is relative. It gives you the shape of the orbital. Right. The shape. We talked about when discussing the Bohr model that this angular momentum, you know, dictates the, the circular motion around the nuclei, right? So you can kind of think of the angular momentum quantum number in a similar way, right? It's dictating the shape of your orbital. And for the angular momentum quantum number, we say that this dictates the subshell, the subshell of your electron, right? So principal quantum number denotes the shell angular momentum quantum number gives you the subshell and we actually have a special way to label these subshells using letters since they come up so often so um so if, let's say for example we have l is equal to zero for l equals zero we call that the s subshell or an s orbital we just use letters to denote these different shells or subshells i should say if L is equal to one, we call that the P subshell. If L is equal to two, we call that the D subshell. If L is equal to three, we call that the F subshell. And then from after you get to the F subshell, it just follows the alphabet after that. So L equals four would be G, L equals five would be H, on and on and on, right? So let me actually put one so that we can see what that looks like, right? So L equals four would be G, and then on and on and on following the alphabet after that. For most practical purposes, for especially for general and organic chemistry, you really are gonna only need to be really familiar with these first three, or at least they're the only ones that are really gonna play much significant role in the chemistry you're gonna study are gonna be S, P, and D orbitals. Um, if you're a chemistry major and you're gonna take advanced coursework, you'll definitely need to be familiar with F orbitals as well as they play a large role for lower um, metals and whatnot, lanthanides and actinides. Um, and as everything else, at, at least at this point, is just kind of theoretical. You can go up to higher and higher angular momentum. Um, but at as far as for most practical purposes in chemistry, those first four are going to be the ones that you'll need to be really familiar with. OK, the third quantum number is known as the magnetic quantum number. The magnetic quantum number, and we use M sub L to denote the magnetic quantum number. Now, this, uh, this value can take on integer values, again, but it is limited. It can also have negative values and it's going to be limited by the angular momentum quantum number. So it can go from negative L to positive L. Right. So, for example, if we're in a P subshell, right, then the possible values of the magnetic quantum number are going to be negative one, zero and positive one. Right. If you're in the D subshell, your possible uh, angular uh, magnetic quantum numbers are going to be negative two, negative one, zero, one and positive two. Right. So um, so this is going to be your magnetic quantum number. And this gives you the orientation of your orbital. Right. So we won't look at it in this video, but in the next video, we'll look at some orbitals 
And you'll be able to see that some orbitals can have the same exact shape, same size, same energy. And the only thing that's different is their orientation. One might lie along the X axis. The other one lies along the Z axis. And we'll take a look at what that looks like. The last quantum number that you need to be familiar with is known as the spin quantum number. So the spin quantum number. And we use M sub S to denote the spin quantum number. And the spin quantum number can only take on one of two values for electrons. It can either be negative one half or it can be positive one half. Right. So negative one half and positive one half are the only uh, values that your spin quantum number can take. And as far as this property of spin, what and what is telling us spin is something that's a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon. Um, so don't think about it in the same way that you would think about something spinning around. It, it is derived from the angular momentum, but um, it's a purely quantum mechanical phenomenon that is important to understand for electrons. Uh, but it comes completely derived from this quantum model, from Schrodinger's equation. Okay, so those are the four quantum numbers that you need to be familiar with. And conceptually, keep in mind when you're thinking about these quantum numbers that it's giving you insight into the wave-like properties of your system. This is how we label the solutions of Schrodinger's equation so that we can define orbitals in a very, you know, bookmark them and label them in a very organized fashion.